Okay, time to round up today's top stories from the world of science with CTV's uh, science and te technology expert, Dan Riskin. Dan, good to see you on this Monday morning. Hope you had a great weekend. I, I definitely did. I hope you did, too. I for sure did. Uh, lots of great sports on TV. I didn't do the Wordle over the weekend. I kind of take the weekends off, but I'm back really? at it today, Dan. Uh, and a lot of people wondering, is there a cheat word for Wordle? Can you help us? Yeah, so, well, some geeks have done some analysis. Some Everybody's geeks. obsessed with Wordle. And, and the thing to get to you is there's only one answer per day, right? You can't right. just binge on it and do 400 Wordles. You have to do one a day and then wait for the next one to come out. So there have only been just over 220 of these things so far. So some geeks went through those and looked at the frequency of, of how frequently letters appeared. And I can tell you the top five letters that appear in Wordle. So you can work them into your guesses early on because they're likely to appear. And the most common five letters in order are E-R-A-O-T, which you can spell orate with. So that's, a, I'm not saying you're gonna win with it, but it's a strategy you might consider if you're trying to get a good shot out of the gate. And the researcher pointed out that all 14,000 words that or that uh, Wordle uses are actually written right into the source code on the website. So if you're enough of a geek to mm -hmm. look at the source code of a website, you can actually see the list of 14,000 words. I don't know if that'll help you, but it, it's there. <laughs> I wouldn't know where to begin, Dan, but I, I did begin today's with Orate. Uh, I won't say what that did for me, but uh, I'm, I'm still working on it. Let, let's just go from there. Uh, let's move on. Uh, so babies, Dan, as we know, they love putting things in their mouths. If it's close by, there's warning on toys and other things just for this. But some new research shows that you know, they notice what their caregivers are putting in their mouths as well. We know babies love mimicking. Right. Babies mimic. Babies pay attention to their caregivers. Babies put things in their mouths. It all comes together in this really neat study that shows that they're paying attention to who is putting things in their mouths and then sharing it with other people who also put it in their mouths. So things like kissing or sharing a bite of a sandwich or something like that, babies know instinctively that that is different from, say, sharing a ball that you just touch with your hands. And the way the researchers found this is they showed little babies a video of a puppet interacting with two women. And one of the women would share an orange with the puppet where they would both take bites of it. And the other woman would share a ball with the puppet where they would both hold it. And then in the little video, the puppet starts to be distressed. It's lonely or something. It's a little bit sad. And they looked at, they tracked the baby's eyeballs to see which caregiver the baby was looking to to solve the problem. And the, the babies looked at the one who had shared food with the puppet, knowing that that meant there was a special bond between those two that was above just sharing a ball with somebody. So babies pay attention to that. And when you see a mom, you know, taking a bite of something and giving it to a baby, there's a lot going on there that the baby's picking up on. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah, that, that's fascinating research indeed, Dan. Uh, before we let you go, though, uh, this is an interesting one, too. You, we all know that sort of magic feeling you get when you just kind of click with someone else. But it's, it's not really magic, though, is it? It's not magic. Can, it can be explained by science. But yes, so, so what is that feeling when you're talking to somebody, you just feel like you've got that energy with somebody. Researchers took a whole bunch of people. They talked either with a stranger or with a friend, and the conversation went back and forth. And then they asked people, how connected did you feel to that person? Do you feel like you clicked? And based on those answers and based on how the conversation went, they looked for correlations. And what they found was the faster people respond after each other talk, the, the smaller the gaps in conversation between one speaker and the other, the more connected the two people feel. And specifically, when a person's talking, it's how quickly they get responded to that makes them feel like they're connected in the conversation. It's not how quickly they jump in, it's how quickly the other person jumps in. And some of those conversations are so fast that it, if you do the calculations, it's cognitively too fast for you to be dishonest in your in your responses. And so it's actually an honest signal of whether you're invested in the conversation. So when you're talking to somebody and you feel that magic, maybe it's not magic, maybe it's just the speed of their responses. All right, that is fascinating. Did I, did I jump in soon enough? Because I feel like we're clicking. You did great, yeah. So we're <laughs> good. I hope I did too. We've clicked. All right, hopefully no one's clicked off at this point. But Dan, always great to talk to you. We'll look forward to the weekly roundup again next week. Until then, have a fantastic week. Thanks a lot, you too. All right, take care. Yesterday, the year of the ox came to an end and we have entered the year of the tiger. Lunar New Year celebrations are currently underway and joining us with more on this is Alan Lam, chairman of the Chinese Cultural Center of Greater Toronto. Uh, Alan, thank you so much for joining us this morning to talk about Lunar New Year. It's another pandemic year. Celebrations once again a bit more subdued, but we know now that gatherings are increased to 10 people inside, so at least people can gather with our families. So let's talk about Chinese 
New Year. I know many people in the West associate lunar, rather lunar New Year, I should say, with uh, the lion dance and red envelopes and dumplings. Uh, but can you go beyond just these iconic images and talk about some of the traditions uh, that people will be marking today? Well, good morning. Uh, Happy New Year, Kong Hei Pa Choi. Uh, the year of a water tiger uh, symbolized vigor, strength, courage, optimism, and resilience. So uh, in our tradition, our rich Chinese uh, tradition, we celebrate New Year, the first day, uh, having uh, a lot of uh, food on the table, uh, including dumpling and uh, many uh, meaningful uh, food. The most important thing, we actually using this uh, festival to gather together with the family, friends, uh, to um, whom that we have not met for many, many, many times, especially in the pandemic. So we're very fortunate that uh, we have this rich tra tradition so that we can actually greet each other and enjoy the company. Yes, it's really a time, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, to get together. And, you know, I used to live in Beijing, China, and they call it the greatest uh, human migration, what happens in China around Chinese New Year. Obviously, this year is not really happening because of COVID-19. Uh, can we talk about some of the preparations that go into prior the, the start of the new year? I know there's a lot of house cleaning. There are some kind of superstitions, such as you shouldn't uh, cut your hair. You should only clean your house a certain time. Can you pick up on some of the, the more interesting kind of traditions and habits that people do uh, to mark the Lunar New Year? Well, we do a lot of preparation uh, at home uh, prior to the New Year Day. For instance, as you mentioned, that um, uh, we clean our house um, for very uh, much we take this opportunity to, um, in the in the old, old beginning, that uh, the cleaning is to swipe away uh, the uh, bad luck. Uh, so then, uh, like for instance, pandemic, uh, we're looking forward to a, a great year of, of Tiger. Uh, I think that uh, the pandemic is very much um, behind us. So we are all looking forward to have a great year. Okay, and Alan, uh, you know, many Chinese immigrants, such as my parents, come to Canada, and I was born here in Canada, in Toronto, and we have a saying that, you know, you're, born, you're Chinese born Canadian or CBCs. Sometimes you call us, there's a term that isn't exactly looked upon too great, but, you know, a lot of the Chinese immigrants call their children bananas uh, to say yellow on the outside, white on the inside, which isn't exactly uh, politically correct. But I want to talk about passing on this tradition Tradition to this younger generation, do you feel like that's a challenge these days? Oh, I wouldn't put it as a challenge. I think it's a question of communications. So for our younger generations, that we uh, had the, uh, I wouldn't say obligation, but I think we feel proud that we are able to take our, tra our tradition, our culture to our children, to take time to explain to them, this is a very good festival time. We can explain to them who we are, and why we are here, and then we adopt a good country, and uh, we just take time to explain to them uh, our rich vision. So then we are for sure is a proud Chinese Canadian and will continue to be. And uh, we really have to make sure that we will tell our children to keep our rich culture and meantime to practice uh, being a very good citizen of Canada. Yeah. Okay, Alan. And very quickly, I know the uh, Chinese Cultural Center of Greater Toronto. You have an event today that's virtual. Can you tell us very quickly about it before we go? Well, um, we have to prepare a virtual um, celebration um, because of the uh, pandemic. So uh, our event actually will be held um, virtually this year, uh, unlike uh, previous years. So we'll be actually uh, live streaming on February the seventh at eight p.m. So. Uh, I like the audience uh, to log on cccgt.org or call my, our office at 416-292-9293, extension 244, to get more information. Okay, Alan Lam, chairman of the Chinese Cultural Center of Greater Toronto, thank you so much for your time, and happy Lunar New Year. Hopefully, the Year of the Tiger brings us all a little more luck. Take care. Well, happy New Year. Thank you. Time now for a show and tell hack pack, some simple ways to save a buck and save the planet by cutting back on trashy habits. And here with more is the creator of the Zero Waste Collective and author of Trashy, a practical guide to living with less waste and more joy, 
Tara McKenna, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, how are you? I'm good, how are you today? Good, thank you. Good, now before we get to the stuff you've got to show and tell, which is awesome, um, I, I like that you've, you've kind of upgraded and updated the sort of the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. And I'm gonna call yours the three B's, buy less, buy better, and bypass single use. So that's a, that's a winning formula that, that's very doable. Yes, it definitely is. It doesn't have to be as daunting as, you know, sometimes it feels when it's about reducing waste. So I have some really simple swaps here. Um, but I'll tell you, I, I was motivated because, you know, I've been traveling over time and, you know, seeing waste when I was snorkeling in Bali in particular really motivated me uh, to make some changes in my life. All right, let's start with your first item, which is a different way to wrap. <laughs> yes, okay, so... This is a beeswax wrap, and this is an alternative to plastic wrap that you find in most kitchens. So when you want to keep food fresh, this is a really great reusable and washable alternative. It's awesome. I love the fact that it's washable and reusable too. It's not, it's, you know, it's not just a good, healthy, single use item. This can be used over and over. Now look, shampoo and conditioner bottles, not just you know, the plastic water and plastic beverage bottles that are creating these you know, trash islands in the oceans. You've got a solution. Yes, so this is a shampoo bar. My husband and I both use this and it lasts us about one to two months. And instead of, you know, throwing out, well, obviously we don't throw out millions, but as Canadians, we throw out millions of bottles yeah. of shampoo and conditioner a year. And these are a really great alternative. Let's stay uh, with a personal hygiene and a different kind of mm -hmm. razor. <laughs> yes, okay, so this is actually going a little bit old school, but this is a safety razor. And the nice thing is it's reusable, obviously, because it's metal here and it will last a lifetime. In fact, I can probably pass it down a couple generations. You know, this is the kind that, uh, that my dad would use, right? The, you screw the top off, you put the new flat, yes. thin, razor yes. thin blade in. And I don't remember my dad tossing up blades so often. That blade is probably a lot more robust than you know, a lot of the ones we pitch you know, after two shaves, or I would. Exactly, they last longer, it's a closer shave, and you can take it to scrap metal recycling right. after. Great solution, Tara. And uh, you're a new mom, congrats on that. Uh, and Thanks. you've got something that relates to that. Yes, okay, so I know this one's a scary choice for a lot of parents, but I promise you it's not that hard. At reusable diapers, I love these. We have 20 that we cycle through. And uh, apparently babies go through over 2,000, about 2,500 in the wow. first year alone. So it's really cool to swap to this. You know, Tara, looking through your bio, you live, you work in Guelph. This is an area that, that uh, has a rich indigenous history. And you know, we can, we can certainly take a lot of clues from our indigenous neighbors when it comes to you know, sustainability and uh, you know, respect it, uh, for the natural world, can't we? Mm -hmm. We definitely can, and we really should, because we live in a beautiful country. And, you know, just simply going for hikes in our backyard, we just realize how important it is to uh, stay closer to nature. Tara McKenna, the Zero Waste Collective creator and author of Trashy, a practical guide to living with less waste and more joy. We thank you for your time. How do folks reach out to you for even more info? Yeah, so you can check out my blog, thezerowastecollective.com. Follow me on Instagram, Zero Waste Collective. And definitely you can find my book anywhere books are sold. Don't be trashy. <laughs> awesome. Tara, thanks again. Congrats on the new baby, your first. And thanks. as we uh, send it over to Nick and Jen, we'll have that little board up there so you can get even more information about how to live waste free or at least mitigate the waste. Thanks, Tara. Yes, thank you. Talented Jan Arden has pretty much conquered it all. Music, TV, a podcast, writing a few nonfiction books. But her latest project brings her back to her musical roots. Joining us live now to discuss her 15th studio album, Descendant, is the one and only Jan Arden. Jan, good morning to you. Uh, let's talk about this album, the title. You say it really sounds like a lot of the songs are from a different time as well. It's highly personal, a homage to the women who came before you, your mom, your great great grandmother mother who had 17 kids. What was it like creating this album during the pandemic? I just want to keep talking about Mika. So <laughs> you guys can go talk about whatever you want. But I from here, just watching that segment, yeah. what an inspiration. And it really makes you just so aware of how in just just how intrepid human beings are. And I guess, you know, connecting to the Descendant record, 
Uh, obviously, Mika has such a, a wonderful support system, and she knows where she's coming from and knows where she's headed. And I think that's one thing that we all have in common is, you know, these people that surround us in our lives, and they don't always have to be here in person. This is a lineage that goes behind us a long, long way. And I'm not a particularly religious person, but I feel my my ancestry. I feel, you know, my mom's been gone just a few years and I absolutely still feel like she's my true north. Mm -hmm. So I think just through a process of osmosis, that's kind of how music comes to be or any kind of art. I can't sit here and tell you how I write a song or how it happens. I don't know. I just know that I was cheered on by a bunch of people that I can't see, but that have inspired me certainly over the course of my life. Yeah, absolutely, Jan. And, you know, you say in writing this album, you never felt closer to your mom uh, who passed away from cancer in 2020. But she actually had Alzheimer's. Oh, she had Alzheimer's. I'm sorry yes. about that. OK, uh, but going back to your family and this album, I was listening to it yesterday and that song called Was I Ever 13? You get really personal, pretty blunt, uh, just about growing up, your childhood. You mm -hmm. talk about your brother huffing gasoline, your father drinking, your mother praying until her hands were blue and then you talk about your own sadness being 16 and the boys were mean i just found so many lyrics in this album were just so candid and vulnerable and i guess i just want to thank you for that and ask you have you ever been so forthcoming in your lyrics in an album before i th i feel like i always have been and honestly i don't censor myself maybe it's a um to my detriment, I'm not sure, but I always just feel like I'm just gonna write this down and I'm not going to second guess myself. You know, this week I've been talking a lot about, and people may have heard me say this, but where I'm at in my life, I have the absence and I'm enjoying the absence of doubt. So mm -hmm. I don't worry about repercussions. I'm not worried about failing. And certainly writing down things like that, my brother was huffing gasoline and my dad was an alcoholic and my mom was constantly worried, but you're not equipped to help a parent when you're 11, 12, 13 years old. Mm -hmm. You kind of just witness it from a distance, but now here I am in my late 50s going, that was, I can't believe we all kind of made it through. Uh, it's one of my favorite songs on the record and I thought it was so personal, but so many people are relating to it. I am getting DMs you know, up the wazoo like, I did that. We had a bonfire and all the kids were there and everyone was drinking beer and my dad was, you know, and I love that it opens a discussion to realize that we're all kind of in the same boat. Yeah, absolutely, Jan. Uh, so many great songs, including the song Descendant, about trying to, you know, swallow the pill, make all the pain go away. But we can't forget the ancestors, the people who came before us uh, to really make it okay or, or just to, to make yeah. it so that we can live our life the way we live it today and that's something we can't take for granted uh jan you're turning 60 that's a Stop milestone it. on march <laughs> on march 27 what is happening i want to segue i, I want to two months to go <laughs> I, I want to segue. This interview's over. <laughs> <laughs> Jan, Jan, I just want to say you've done it all. You've done everything. I just want to know what's what's next. That's our milestone song, Jan. What's you know, next for you? You've done everything. Would it kill you to put me on Dancing with the Stars? <laughs> would it kill you to put me on Big Big Brother House? <laughs> no. You know, I, I have no bucket list, honestly. Uh -huh. I am just looking forward to failing at more things, having a purposeful life, hanging out with my friends. You know, I'm I'm so positive. We will get back to where we need to get back from, but good things do come out of bad things. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for this music. I'm so great. And I have to say this, this is not a paid endorsement. Universal Music, I've been with them 30 years this year, and this is my 15th record. I think I make them $6 every time I make them. <laughs> oh, my God. And, uh, no, no, I, it, it could be closer to $11 U.S. dollars, and they stay the course with me. I even say to the president, Jeffrey, what are you blanking thinking keeping me on this label? And he's like, Jan... We love you. We love your music. We think legacy is important. Uh, I don't know many artists that have been on the same label for 30 years. No. And he's like, let's keep doing it. And I felt this huge lump in my chest when I left 
um, you know, when I left the building and I just thought, I am so grateful. I'm not particularly fashionable, nor have I ever been. I am not going to be heard at a rave. I am for personal consumption. You'll hear me in a minivan and maybe at a Pilates session. <laughs> Today is World Cancer Day, and the past couple of years have made an already tough situation even more challenging to manage due to the constant rescheduling and treatment delays as a result of COVID-19. Well, joining us now is Dr. Stuart Edmonds of the Canadian Cancer Society and Melody Sir, a cancer patient who had to wait an entire year before getting a biopsy that confirmed <clears throat> her cancer. Uh, Melody, Dr. Edmonds, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I want to start with you, Melody, because this is a pretty scary situation, kind of the worst situation you can hope for. You were di They found a nodule in your thyroid in 2020. Your biopsy was canceled because it wasn't considered urgent. And then bam, a year later, it's discovered to be precancerous. Tell us what you went through here. Um, yeah, so the, the day before my biopsy was scheduled, I received a call and they said that uh, the type of cancer, thyroid cancer, is not really an urgent type of cancer during COVID. And so all uh, a diagnostic uh, or diagnostic uh, uh, appointments were canceled due to COVID. And so I had to wait an entire year to finally receive the biopsy. And they found um, just abnormal cells, but not enough to give a, a cancer diagnosis. So uh, I decided to move on with a surgery and remove half of my thyroid uh, due to this tumor. Wow, Melody, I'm glad you're okay and that they managed to remove it in time. But obviously, uh, Dr. Edmonds, this is a terrifying situation and we're probably seeing a lot of situations like Melody's in which these cancer screenings are getting delayed and being rescheduled. Uh, what's the impact of having, let's say, a four week delay when it comes to cancer diagnoses? Well, uh, the, the impact is, is, is huge. And um, we, we know in terms of uh, um, surgeries, for example, or treatment, that a, that, that a four-week delay in treatment can, for, for many cancers can actually lead to a 10% um, a increase in the risk of death. So, so again, a huge in, um, impact there. And in terms of screening, um, this, uh, a study has shown that a three-month suspension in um, colorectal cancer screening could lead to an increase in... Uh, 1,100 new cancer cases of colorectal cancer and, and with more than 480 um, more colorectal cancer deaths. So really the impact of, of um, uh, disruptions or delays in screening and uh, surgery are, 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 are significant. Melody, I want to go back to you now. Uh, when you discovered that this was precancerous, what was your immediate thought? Did you feel that you were neglected during COVID-19 because of, you know, all the hospital resources being diverted to patients with COVID? Absolutely. Um, as a medical physicist myself, I know the impact of cancer and I know how fast growing it can become. And um, knowing that I had a precancerous tumor inside my body, it was very, very frightening. And um, I wanted to get it removed or get it diagnosed right away to know what I was dealing with. So it was very frightening, a very frightening situation. Okay. And once they, they found that there were precancerous cells, did they then move quickly? Yes, absolutely. I was able to uh, get a surgery right away. Okay. Uh, Dr. Edmonds, unfortunately, we're running out of time to talk about this, but this is uh, very important indeed. What more needs to be done? Because it's not just about rescheduling and delays when it comes to cancer treatment, right? Well, that, that's right. I think you know, when, when we have, um, obviously, there's delays right now, but we also have a backlog. This, this, this hasn't been happening over the last few months. It's been happening over the last, over the whole, entire pandemic. And, and what we really want we, we're urging governments to continue to prioritize the needs of, of cancer patients at this time and, and really uh, share information on where we are in terms of backlog, but also develop a, a recovery plan for how we're going to actually deal with these backlogs going forward. And, and we're actually asking, asking individuals to, uh, to, to, to sign up and actually urge, 
urge, um, urge the governments to, uh, to continue to prioritize cancer patients at this time. They can go to cancer.ca, World Cancer Day, and, and, uh, and write to their MPs and, and, uh, and, and continue to put pressure on the governments to keep cancer a priority. Yeah, it certainly needs to be. Okay, Dr. Stuart Edmonds and Melody Sir, thank you so much for joining us, joining us this morning on CP24 Breakfast. Take care.